In case you haven't noticed, this is not 3D printing. In this video, I want to show you how 3D unprinting works. Welcome to the world of subtractive manufacturing. The Makeera Carvera original came out a couple of years ago. Actually, it feels like a couple of years ago, but it was 2021. This original Carvera was a tool-changing CNC, and it was well-received at the time. But at the same time, it wasn't affordable to most people, which meant, I guess, it was hard to justify for home users, leaving the majority of us to just gaze longingly um, at this thing. Enter the Carvera Air, which came out a year ago via Kickstarter, but it's now on general sale, and it's around the price of a Bamboo H2D, so it makes it a lot more affordable. The Carvera Air doesn't actually have the tool changer part. Instead, it has a quick release handle, which you pull down to swap nozzle um, bits. This is a literal two second job, and honestly, printer manufacturers, is there any good reason why we can't have something like this? Anyway, the argument for a tool changer isn't that clear, like it might be on something like the Prusa XL printer, primarily because of the way that CNC machines tend to be used. Let me explain. You know how with a 3D printer, when you print an object, you might change tool, colour, filament, whatever, on average every two layers. It's actually every layer, but if you watch how the slicer works, it's optimised that because it knows that you could do A, B, then B, A. Don't want to get into that. But you put the G-code into the machine, you press go, you walk off, essentially. That's the workflow we're used to on 3D printers. And so, obviously, you can't change filament manually every other layer. Occasionally we've had people doing weird stuff like tinkering with the output g-code. We've also got colour changes by layer if you want to make, say, a sign or something. Adding extra steps like multiple g-code files, printing on top of an existing print, figuring out where power failures happened, that kind of thing, sticking magnets in, so on and so on. But this always seems like something you wouldn't want to do with a 3D printer. It seems like you're going outside of the normal operation. But with subtractive manufacturing, that's just a normal day. In every piece that I've made on the Carvera Air, with very few exceptions for very simple things, every single one of them was not a single operation, but a sequence of different cutting operations, and each one takes up one tool. So what I'm saying is, in this situation, you're using one tool for one operation, you're then stopping the machine, you're changing that one tool, you're doing the next operation, and on average for me, at least the number of tools was around three, with I think a maximum of four tools. So for a total of three or four changes per job, not per layer like in 3D printing, but per actual finished part, I would say automated tool changing is definitely way more of a luxury than a necessity. And unlike 3D printers that we're not supposed to leave unattended, but of course we do, CNC machines really do need to be watched. Because I guess you, you don't really want to start cutting into the clamps or whatever. But anyway, the point is not having a tool changing CNC hasn't bothered me one bit. Get it? One bit. Never mind. Now, I've never used a CNC before firsthand. Um, I'm well aware of them and I'm well aware of how they work. I may have told Makeera that I have because I kind of pretend I know things that I don't. But don't worry, it was fun to see how quickly I would pick it up. And you can judge for yourself in the video how that went. We're going from never using one before to being able to actually make parts, not necessarily good ones. I would say that mostly I'm limited at this point by my own laziness and problem solving skills because CNC operation is, I would say, 10% knowing how to actually use the machine. That's the easy part. 90% being able to reason out how you decide to machine a part in the first place. And I think that's probably a lot of experience that the people who operate these machines industrially are tapping into. It's the hard part of the process. So let's step back a bit. What does this machine do and how do you make it do it? 
The basic model is a three axis cutter, so that's X, Y, and Z without the ability to tilt the drill part at all. This is actually pretty standard, exactly what we're used to in 3D printing. A fourth axis in this context refers not to an extra axis of movement, and we're not going into a new dimension. What it means is it actually rotates the part. What actually looks like a small lathe is a stepper motor holding the part, so it turns fairly slowly to allow you to do circular stuff. This is an optional add-on, and I think it's an add-on worth getting, in my opinion. To make things with the Carvera, you can use a full CAD like Fusion 360, or you can use Carvera software that they provide as a download, which is limited compared to a full CAD, I think. But at the same time, if you're new to CNC or you're new to CAD, or worst case scenario, new to both, you're going to have some fun. Or indeed, just if you're a bit lazy, because it's simpler to use the Makera software and it has all the material and presets already in there, including the, the feed rates. So the Carvera software is probably what you want to use unless you have a specific need to use anything else. At this point, I'll also share something that I've learned the hard way, but any engineer already knows. You are going to be best off designing your parts for the subtractive process rather than trying to throw something that's existing, like an FDM design, at the software so that you don't end up staring at your STL file in the, in the Makera software and thinking, how do I even start cutting this? Makeara CAD is entirely capable of shaping the face of an object to match an STL using something called a relief. What I'm saying is, I guess, it's a much more deliberate process. When you make a part, you think about how the machine will cut it in the first place, what tools you're going to use, and importantly, always keeping the geometry of the stock, that's the piece you're cutting out, and how the design elements relate to it. It sounds really complicated on the face of it, but actually once you get into it and start thinking that way, it kind of seems more logical, and I think a lot of that will translate back to 3D printing, and it probably will make you a better designer for 3D printing in the first place. Moving on to another add-on kit, uh, they sent reviewers all the add-ons as far as I can tell, so I'll show you them and I'll demo most of it, um, but this is a whole thing on its own, and you can make a whole video about this, and that's the PCB fabrication kit. This is great because you can just make fully functional PCBs at home without having to use any chemicals, which is exactly the kind of thing that I want to do when I'm prototyping before I get it sent off to make it commercially. It's sort of like halfway between breadboard and getting a PCB made, if that makes sense. So this isn't new, PCB milling machines are pretty old actually, but there you go, you can do that now, you can do PCB milling. There's even the option of rolling on some kind of paint that is UV um, curing, which is the colourful stuff that you get on top of PCBs, that's what makes them look cooler, and I think it's there to resist oxidation and to resist a lot of shorting if you put it down on a metal table or whatever. This is then carved away with these bits that look really tiny, or you can use the laser add-on, hold that thought. The final PCBs that you can make out of this are pretty respectable, but you are using a 0.1mm drill bit, but that's not that small in the PCB world, so they do specify what the minimum track size is. As you can see, this is great for hobby use, but you're not really getting that close to PCB fab PCBs like this one from PCBWay. They're not sponsoring this episode, it's just that obviously those are the PCBs I have that I've made, so I'm showing you it for comparison. I haven't got round to putting the solder mask on yet because it's a whole thing you have to figure out in the software how to engrave it, and I, I just haven't got round to that because there's so much going on in this video as is, as you can see. So the laser module, this is a diode laser of magnitude 5 watts. 5 watts will get you engraving stuff, but not really cutting it. Lasers are well outside of my expertise still, I've never used one. It is there, it's an optional extra. Unlike the last two modules though, I'm not going to show you this working. While they do provide you with this fetching pair of tinted spectacles, I always said that the only laser I would use would be a fully interlocked and closed one, and that's not something I'm going to compromise on in a CNC review. I think this is an opportunity missed really because, I mean, maybe they would consider it for the future and that's to take the existing shielding that works really well on the machine, which keeps all the dust and swarf inside. They could just make that laser opaque or they could provide one if they sold one or included it with the laser add-on kit in the first place, even if it was like 200 pounds more, I think I would buy it. In fact, no, I'm sure I would buy it. If they make it, I will buy it right now. Anyway, even if I was using it, I wouldn't want to point my expensive camera at it just in case any sort of specular ref reflection comes off and hits it. Um, that's, a, that's a thing. That would, that would really happen, I think. 
Along with all the modules and add-ons, there's a whole bunch of bits that they've sent. And there's a toolkit, and that is definitely standard. And there's enough material to make all the examples, which are in the really well-written examples book, which is one of the two books that you get with the print machine. This level of guidance is actually not only really good and I think necessary because a lot of people, including myself, would be entirely hitting a brick wall of a learning curve without it. So it's definitely advantageous to be able to get comfortable by using the pre-prepared examples and you can pick and choose them. You can do the ones that you want to. Like I didn't do the acrylic light one because I felt that by the time I got to that one I kind of felt comfortable in just going off and doing my own thing and I, and I did my own logo on the acrylic instead. So that's all about the kits and what you get with the machine. I think we need to talk about power because you might be surprised to hear that the Carvera Air, just like its predecessor, it looks a bit low power on paper. Probably because it is. The motor power is 200 watts and that is significantly lower than a lot of equivalent models out there, which does mandate a few concessions, presumably on harder materials. The drill bits are smaller, which helps a lot, but the speed at which you're working with, as in not the speed of the spindle, but the speed that, that you're able to cut, is the main casualty typically of a lower power spindle. It's not a problem for wood, plastic, and the weird resin stuff that looks like wood but isn't, but you will have to slow down for harder things like brass, aluminium, although I was actually surprised by how little problem most small jobs with these materials is. Aluminium cutting is really not a problem. Probably this is helped by the profiles being tuned to give you the right layer height, um, plunge depth, and the correct feed rates. A lot of the materials that I'm showing you didn't come with the machine, but I ordered them myself. I'll try to label which is which. One of the things I ordered, I think it's called HDPE two color plastic sheet. You machine through the top layer and it's white underneath. You can get other colour combinations including black with white on top. We also didn't talk about spoil boards which is one of the things that you kind of need to know to make everything make sense. It's a board that goes underneath and it's kind of permanently fixed to what you would call the bed so that when you cut through a piece you're cutting slightly into the spoil board. It's typically made of MDF although I think these ones are actually a different material. How long these last, it depends on how good you are at planning your operations. Again, it's down to the math, but also the kind of things that you're making and how often you need to go through the part into the spoil board. They are quite cheap to replace though. I bought five of them with the order I talked about already. Finally, I'm determined in this video not to get too bogged down and into the weeds on the tutorial aspect of things because if you look at the Make Area YouTube channel, you'll see that there is a lot of help there, far more than I can do, and indispensable on both how to use the machine and the software, and it's really well paced as well. I learned most of what I learned from those videos. I think they're adding stuff all the time, so that's cool. So where does this leave us? This is a 3D printing channel and it will remain a 3D printing channel for the time being, but it's hard to deny that for a lot of use cases for parts you might actually need, you are going to find subtractive manufacturing as a process and the materials that you can use with it to be overwhelmingly the better choice. So this machine is not going anywhere and I'll be featuring it here and there in future content. I think in terms of you, the viewer, there's a really similar calculus. What are you actually doing with your 3D printing is the question that you need to ask. Is it a tool? Is it a hobby? This will hugely impact how interested you might be in adding this kind of thing, this kind of machine to your garage if you have space for it. And I guess it also determines whether you're interested in increasing your skill set to become more capable of using it. It's certainly a very approachable way to get into the CNC world in the first place, which of course can be quite intimidating. Let me know in the comments what you think as always, and I will see you next time where we might be doing some stuff with more exotic filaments. And I promise none of them will contain poop. If you know, you know. Thank you for watching.
Thank you.